Currently live. Good morning, and welcome to this public meeting of the Consumer Product Safety Commission. Before we start, can I confirm that all of the commissioners are here? Commissioner Feldman? Present. Commissioner Boyle? Present. Sorry, one of our Commissioner Trumpka. Yes, good morning. Good morning, everybody. I also note this is our first meeting without Commissioner Biacco, uh, which brings us to a panel of four commissioners. Uh, I know that she will be missed and hope she does well in her next endeavors. Um, but this morning, CPSC staff will be briefing the commission on the fiscal year 2023 operating plan. This is the first operating plan to come up during my tenure, and I look forward to examining it with my colleagues and working with them over the coming weeks to ensure that the plan puts this agency in the best possible position to protect consumers during this fiscal year and into the future. In a moment, I will turn this meeting over to staff so they can brief us. Uh, once they've completed the briefing, each commissioner will have 10 minutes to ask questions of staff with multiple rounds if necessary. Briefing us today is Jason Levine, CPSC's Executive Director. He is joined by James Baker, our Chief Financial Officer. Also joining us today are Pam Springs, Director of the Oper uh, Office of Communications, Austin Schlick, General Counsel, and Alberta Mills, the uh, Commission Secretary. Thank you. With that, I'm going to turn the microphone over to Mr. Levine. Good morning. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Commissioners. Uh, and thank you for the slide. Uh, good morning. So today we are going to be discussing our proposed fiscal year 2023 operating plan, which uh, as we'll get into both through this slide package and discussion today lays out our major projects, rulemakings, areas of enforcement focus, performance measures, and much more. Uh, these staff proposals as part of the op plan represents proposed projects at funding level that is functionally actually lower than our current funding level. Uh, but also lays out a secondary funding level that matches our 2023 performance budget request, which was passed in March. Next slide, please. As mentioned, um, we are going to be looking at two separate uh, funding levels today. Sorry, screen initiative. Um, one of which is based on our 2023 budget performance request as passed by the commission in March, which is a level of 195.5 million dollars, uh, including 672 FTEs. The uh, second level is, uh, oh, sorry, and I should note that there has been no appropriations level set yet for fiscal 23 for the commission, and we are operating currently. Under a continuing resolution uh, at 139.05 million dollars, which uh, through December 16th is approximately 29.3 million dollars. Next slide, please. We do have two potential uh, congressional levels. Those are not laid out in the op plan, but we thought worthy of note. Uh, one, the, the House did pass a 2023 operations appropriations level for 166 million, which does include 2.5 million in no year funds for the Virginia Graham Baker Pool and Spa Safety Act grant program. Senate appropriation proposed a level, um, but hasn't passed through, so we're not going to spend a lot of time talking about that at this point in time. Next slide, please. Okay, um, so presented today is, is a slightly different version uh, or slightly different methodology when we look at the op plan than we've used in the past and that we lay out two different budgetary levels uh, in, uh, in the first sections of the op plan based on the disparity, pretty significant disparity between our requested level uh, and the continuing resolution level. Um, recognizing the unlikelihood uh, of the number staying exactly either at the 2022 continuing resolution level or exactly the 195.5, uh, the requested level, one would expect our, our mid-year process, which historically takes place sometime in the uh, late winter or early spring, to be used to amend the plan before you today based on our full year's appropriation level. Next slide, please. The um, 
the document before you is based in, in large part out of two separate documents. Uh, one is the draft strategic plan, which we considered a couple, a couple of months ago, the 2023 through 26 plan, uh, as you see the four goals listed there as well as the priorities, these six bullets laid out in the 23 budget request uh, approved by the commission <clears throat> earlier this spring as well. So the, the goal of the plan is to weave those two um, documents and concepts together in a way that is reflective of the proposed activity. Next slide, please. Uh, so this slide is, is as it's as it's labeled, uh, a content slide, uh, which lays out sort of the format of of the document um, and the 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 items I would note here in particular, I think is uh, the appendix the appendices for the appendix appendix C uh, does lay out the operating plan alignment to the draft strategic plan, which I just mentioned. Um, but I think throughout what you'll, you'll see again is, is this overlay of those two documents together uh, and obviously the standard tables, the listed reports we propose to undertake this year. Next slide, please. Okay. The, um, so these two are going to be talking about the summary of changes based on, again, these two separate levels. The summary of changes here. Uh, does assume a 4.6% increase in pay to be mandated um, by Congress and trying to keep ourselves at the 539 plan positions level. However, because at the moment uh, we are presuming for the sake of um, the process that we will be remaining at actually a, a functionally lower level than we were last year and that we are 139.05 and would not receive the 4.6%. Um, we would be only be funded if the number lasted for the full year at 514 FTEs. Uh, now, our current onboard level puts us in a, in a comfortable position uh, with respect to this level, um, but we would need to monitor very closely uh, critical hires, uh, attrition rates when positions are backfilled. Uh, we're, again, where we'd have a full year at the 139.05 level, uh, which we're certainly hoping is not the case. Um, and you'll see in the document, the non-payroll allowances have been adjusted um, to reflect the known escalation costs in rent and a standard 2% inflationary number, which recognizing not always the sort of the full uh, economy's inflation rate, but it is sort of a standard OMB uh, percentage rate that we are using. And you'll note in the document, there's a $0 increase under the CR level for VGB grant funding, um, but we do have $2 million of 23 funding within the CR level as planned, and there's $3 million carry forward from prior years uh, as part of no year funds explicitly for VGBA grant funding. Next slide, please. Uh, continuing. At the CR level, the next couple of slides are all going to have ARPA, so I do want to be specific in, in referencing which levels we're talking about. Uh, so the American Rescue Plan Act funding is currently being used as approved by the commission earlier this spring to fund 46 uh, FTEs and a $2 million in recurring contract costs. There's also a uh, one-time cost of 900000 for phase three of the global data, global data synchronization network. Uh, and a few other items that are were approved in 22 and will be obligated in 23. Those would all be funded out of ARPA um, under the um, the statutory uh, bullets, as I like to call them. There that that would allow that allow us to to, to move in these different directions, both with respect to ports, uh, e-commerce, and other uh, information and education activities uh, along those lines. Next slide, please. Okay, so the summary of changes that you'll see in the document that respond to the budget level, again, that's that 195.5 level, uh, have an increase, obviously, uh, not just of the 4.6%, also of that 2% that I mentioned uh, in terms of uh, inflationary costs. 
includes a 29, almost a $30 million increase and 87 FTE increase in those 6 budget priority levels, as well as additional uh, inspector general support. And reflects a 9 million dollar transfer from salaries and expenses. Um, to those ARPA funds are being used as the 9 million dollars to be transferred to. Our base salary expenses under the proposed budget. Um, so that 46, we just talked about that are currently under ARPA would be transferred to our, our base budget as it were. Um, the only change from. Uh, for with respect to VGB funding would be an additional 0.5 million dollars getting us a 2.5, which would reflect the house mark uh, and that 3 million dollars remains carried forward the no year funds. Next slide. Please. So, again, I, as I just mentioned, the transfer. Uh, under the budget level, as we refer to it in the document that 195 to 23 budget request. Uh, would be a transfer of that 46 FTEs and the 2 million recurring costs. The one time costs uh, for the GDSN would remain uh, under ARPA, but otherwise those funds could be used for more, uh, more of the items that uh, are also contemplated under, under the American Rescue Plan Act, including e commerce activities, one time contracting costs, um, were we to get the, the full appropriation. Next slide, please. Okay, um, so now getting into some of the meat uh, of, the, of the document itself, the, the first item that we'd stop uh, and, and reference is the mandatory standards table. And just uh, in terms of the changes from uh, where we were, the fiscal 23 budget request listed nine uh, mandatory standards rulemakings, those would be anything from notice of proposed rulemaking all the way through final rules and everything in between. So that's where these numbers are reflective of their an additional 21 from that nine, uh, but there are also three that have been removed from that nine, which gets us to a total of 27 uh, rules laid out in the mandatory standards table. Obviously, even with the under the CR level, we're proposing an incredibly ambitious uh, slate of, of rules and, and ambitious operating plan in general. Um, and I think that's perhaps most uh, starkly reflected in the mandatory standards table. Next slide, please. Uh, similarly, the, the change here as noted from the budget request and the, and the voluntary standards activities uh, is a change of uh, an additional seven activities, uh, voluntary standard activities uh, as listed here, none were removed from the voluntary standards table in the 23 budget request document. Next slide, please. Uh, so without reading, uh, you know, each, each bullet here, uh, what we, what we did want to highlight sort of for each individual organization and obviously these subsume such a significant portion of work. And even if we were to read all of them, it doesn't get into all of the many, many different activities uh, from each organization. But we do want to highlight some of the some of the priorities uh, and, and they're listed as, as priorities and by organization within the document, uh, including uh, within the XHR working on and completing is the goal within 2023. NPRs on infant pillows, portable generators, furnaces, battery ingestions, and as I just discussed, many more items. Uh, there's the report uh, that is uh, an outgrowth of, of the work um, on the executive order 13985, uh, the, the investigation on racial and socioeconomic safety differences that, that is proposed to be completed this year. Uh, we also have new statutory direction in addition to the significant um, section, what we, what we call section seven and nine rulemaking that we've undertaken this, uh, this past year and we're, and we're completing and some of those we're working on looking at today. Um, we also have received some, some statutory direction from Congress on some updates that EXHR is going to be focusing on. It'll be Reese's law on, on button batteries, portable fuel containers. Uh, so that's some additional work that, uh, wasn't necessarily conceived of. Uh, a year and a half ago, or, you know, or 
even a year ago when putting together some of the, some of these documents. Uh, in addition to uh, that list at the bottom, which is again just a sort of highlight list, but not anywhere close to the full list of potential safety areas and issues that we'll be working on over the course of the year. Uh, next slide, please. So for our Office of uh, Compliance and, and Field Operations, uh, again, a sim similar um, in addition to the previously laid out concepts uh, of, of areas of focus, there are these new areas for compliance to be focusing on, uh, whether those be by, by commission um, rulemaking, such as um, infant sleep rule leading um, to infant sleep products, uh, increased activity, whether it be the Safe Sleep for Babies Act and, and, and things like crib bumpers, inclined sleepers, the new magnet rule, all of those are, are newer activities for the Office of Compliance to um, be taking a look at in terms of enforcement. In addition to our continued effort to ramp up our online surveillance, uh, which has uh, increased uh, over, over the last year or two in, in a significant way in terms of our compliance activities, uh, our, our continued CAP compliant or corrective action plan monitoring, uh, strengthening, and working with companies, uh, ideally cooperatively, if not otherwise, to uh, ensure not only fulfillment of their CAP obligations, but um, their uh, their requirements under under those CAP obligations, and working towards recall uh, responsiveness where uh, where possible. Um, as I mentioned, uh, Executive Order thirteen nine eight five uh, is spread throughout. The document and throughout the, the organizations uh, in terms of the variety of different activities we're trying to undertake to um, address the issues that were identified in the equity action plan. Uh, I'm not going to read the rest of those, but there's some, some of the highlights. Next slide, please. Our Office of uh, Import Surveillance. I would note for those watching who have not yet registered, we do have a workshop tomorrow that I'd uh, recommend you pop by for uh, e-filing. Um, but at any rate, the, the goal of um, th these variety of goals demonstrate uh, another of our um, frontline on the ground folks, in addition to our compliance and field operations, our import folks uh, who are working um, not only at the ports, but also, you know, in, in the e-commerce, sorry, not only at our, our traditional ports, but also working uh, at, at uh, an increased effort to work on the, the, the ports where we're seeing large volumes of de minimis shipments, um, as opposed to our more traditional larger shipments. That's something that is a project that's going to be front and center uh, this fiscal year. Um, in addition, again, to our traditional Working on, you know, stopping our non the non compliant consumer products, um, including the counterfeit products that pose a safety risk. Uh, trying to expand our, our presence, our continued cooperation and, and coordination with CBP uh, is obviously top of mind. Um, as mentioned, there's this the e filing program. We're looking to submit a NPR this fiscal year that uh, would enable the CPSC to to fully implement the e filing pilot. Uh, and there is that beta pilot that is ongoing, and that's the workshop I reference tomorrow. Um, and of course, working with uh, our small business ombudsman uh, to help educate uh, importers, because the, mo the what we want more than anything else is an educated, uh, regulated community, and compliant one, of course. Too. Uh, next slide. Uh, our international program, uh, which. Uh, works to ensure again in, in the concept of um, pardon, one second there. Uh, in the concept of, of helping to train both uh, foreign governments and as, as well as as foreign uh, companies in terms of our uh, compliance with CPSC regulations, CPSC requirements. Um, there's a real value in us going out and undertaking that training uh, both sort of on a, on a on a bilateral basis, as well as through programs like the United Nations uh, Intergovernmental Group of Experts, uh, and then they're, you know, in addition to just participating in international forums wherever we can to spread the word about our requirements uh, and about how to, you know, move that safety by design 
uh, as far up the supply chain as possible. Next slide, please. Okay, uh, the Office of Communications uh, really has, um, it really will be, sorry, forward facing, really will be focusing on uh, expanding public engagement with CPSC safety messaging through a large variety of, of means. And actually, as you see reflected on this slide in of itself, both talking about on the digital side, uh, digital content, online, social media, but also uh, at the bottom, you know, the bottom of the slide, we're, you know, we're looking at how do we undertake out of home advertising, reaching communities that aren't necessarily always online, the underserved communities, historically excluded communities, bus shelters, um, billboards, looking to really expand the reach of our messaging. We, we've always said and continue to believe in such good content and information that we want to make sure that consumers have. Um, how do we make sure we reach them where they are? And, and the office communications is really focusing on pushing that forward. Uh, also listed here are four of the larger information education campaigns that are contemplated uh, within the office for fiscal 23. Uh, next slide, please. Office of Information Technology exit. Uh, we will be continuing the multi-year project uh, to establish the agency data lake, uh, which will, as noted, store and provide access to the data assets, both for analytical and for reporting purposes. Uh, this is a, it's an ongoing project, which you know we certainly hope to see significant strides on this this fiscal year to allow us to start to see some of the benefits of that activity. Um, you know, and so much of, of what we've listed here, are some of the sort of top line highlights, but obviously so much of what we do is, is built on the back uh, of the information technology program. And um, whether it be developing and, and, and moving forward, the long desired upgraded case management system for compliance uh, or that the filing program requirements and moving us forward, uh, we have a number of, of legacy uh, systems that need to be uh, upgraded and updated, uh, and that's you know what we are undertaking. And then, as noted, though it's the last bullet on the slide, you know we never want to minimize the need to increase our cybersecurity uh, and increase our um, our ability to be you know, phishing resistant um, for particularly for external users as well who are accessing our systems and data because we want to be able to share that data with the public. Next slide, please. So similar to the strategic plan uh, concept uh, where that was goal four of the strategic plan where we talked about what had traditionally been thought of as, as support offices, uh, here's it's just a, a, a very brief mention uh, of, of the of one or two of the highlights for each of, you know, of these many different offices, the Office of Equal Employment Opportunity, Diversity and Inclusion, uh, General Counsel, Legislative Affairs, Financial Management, Resource Management. Um, all of these different offices, uh, you know, have have some goals laid out in, in the operating plan. But I think what's also important to note is how much of what they're doing is is built in to allowing for the success of of every, all the other offices we just talked about. So, um, whether we're talking about uh, working and moving forward on the equity action plan in terms of sharing what it is that we're doing uh, outside of the agency. Uh, and, and and working with stakeholders to continue to, to move forward on that, whether it's um, attending career fairs and undertaking our, our recruiting, um, working on uh, improving our Freedom of Information Act response rates, uh, all of these different pieces, uh, you know, everything that, that financial management does to meet our OMB requirements are sort of laid out in the plan. I just want to make sure we highlighted those here uh, in this presentation, I believe. Nope. Yep, that's our last slide. Last next slide, please. That is our last slide. So that is it for our presentation. We're happy to take your questions this morning. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lean, um, Mr. Levine, for the presentation and for the briefing. Um, staff is presenting an aggressive agenda for the coming year with a robust rulemaking agenda that includes 27. Rulemaking activities and an increase uh, from the 21 listed in last year's op plan. So, 
I'm going to turn at this point in time over to questions from all the commissioners. As, a, as I mentioned before, um, we're going to go to 10 minute rounds um, in order of seniority with multiple rounds as necessary. Uh, so, in looking at the plan, in addition to being uh, a number of new activities, the uh, plan also makes clear that the impact that the agency can see from the continuing resolution, resolutions holding us flat has um, significant consequences. Can you provide a little bit more background on why the operating plan prevents, excuse me, presents two different spending levels and what those two spending levels represent? Sure, thank you. Uh, for the question, because I, and while I, I think I mentioned it, I think it's laid out in the plan. I, I do think it's important to, to spend a minute just uh, being clear that they, these are pretty dramatically different plans, right? One's at one, one's at one thirty nine, one's at one ninety five. Um, the and, th and that's an additional um, fifty six point four five million dollars and one hundred and thirty three FTEs above the CR level. So, um, what we've tried to be sure to do is prepare, uh, you know, as I say, prepare for the worst, expect the best, uh, lay out a, a plan that uh, tries to accomplish as many goals as possible under our current resources at, at that CR level. Uh, so, the, the bulk of the operating plan does, does correspond to activities which we've undertaken at that CR level. But the, the again, that, that first part of, of the operating plan does lay out the, the major activities that we would see at that 195 level um, because, you know, we're, we're optimistic. Uh, certainly, we believe we've made a good case as to why those, those dollars would be used in that way. Um, but importantly, the 23 is aligned with our 22 appropriation, and you can see the outgrowth of those, uh, of those dollars and those programs laid out uh, in, in a sort of, um, uh, in a way that grows from the 22 uh, appropriations level. Uh, but I'd also note that the, um, again, unless we get exactly the number 139 or 195, we will be coming back uh, in, in the mid-year process to uh, align our final numbers with, um, with projects that will be proposed based on those numbers. Thanks. I too am well. I think this agency can do a tremendous amount with more funding, and we certainly have advocated for that. And the uh, White House has supported a much higher funding level for for the agency. So I'm hopeful that will come through. Um, that being said, recognizing that we are operating under a continuing resolution that will hold us uh, steady until. December at least, and then we'll see what happens after that. But if we were held to our FY22 levels uh, for the entire uh, year, what's going to be the impact on CPSC staffing? Yeah, um, you know, unfortunately, it, were we to be held to this level for the full for the full fiscal year, we would not be able to support our planned 539 FTE level. Um, so what? You know, the, the the plan to address that sort of shortfall would be certainly initially just to monitor our hiring levels. We're, you know, we're currently probably around 515 or so FTEs on board, not counting the ARPA funded FTEs. Um, so, as there was attrition, as there was a need to backfill positions, we would uh, very carefully uh, consider where we need. Uh, where those emergencies are versus uh, where we might have to hold off on hiring if we were to get through the whole, if we were to imagine the whole fiscal year at this level. Um, and then we'd likely return to the commission with options regarding um, planned contractual obligations that we would uh, potentially not be able to undertake in fiscal 23. Uh, again, if, if we were to be at this level for the full year. So uh, it would certainly put a, um, it would it would not allow us to meet our already uh, understaffed goal in terms of 539. And presumably, if we're running at lower levels of staff because we don't want to place people who have left, it's going to impact our ability to get the work done that's anticipated in the plan as well. Absolutely. 
And you mentioned the American Rescue Plan Act funds, ARPA funds, and they are separate from our annual appropriations. Can you just explain a little bit more how that fits into what you just talked about? Sure. So uh, again, sort of separating from the CR level and the budget level. Um, at the CR level, we'd anticipate spending the total of 9.9 .9 million in uh, in fiscal 23 from the American Rescue Plan Act funds, um, which would include those 46 FTEs that we talked about. Um, now, of that 9.9, .9, I'm just checking my notes. 9.9 .9 million of that is for pay and recurring contract costs. That remaining 0 0.9, that 900,000 is that one-time cost related to the, the um, that continued enhancement to the import targeting surveillance system, the GDSN project I mentioned earlier. Again, that's under the 23, uh, that's under the construct of a, a full year's um, CR and, and no funding to help us uh, transfer or offset from ARPA. Were we to receive the 23 budget level or something close to it, uh, the proposed op plan would shift or, or transfer that $9 million for pay and recurring costs, contract costs, back to annual salaries and expenses. Um, and then that would free up, you know, more of the, the funds for um, investment of one-time technology costs and other of the ARPA requirements. So it's obviously very stark. I mean, one is exclusively coming out of, out of the ARPA uh, funding stream and the other would go directly from our appropriated salaries and expenses level. So I think I started by saying that the staff has presented an operating plan that is aggressive, but I'm always eager to try and do more on the to advance product safety. Um, other ways to speed up some of the timelines, but it's in the work that we're doing, the other uh, rulemakings that we have laid out there. Um, you know, the, the, there's always a balancing act for for the opportunity to um, try and move things uh, in, in a more expedited way. Um, some of those are are obviously dependent upon, as we just talked about, funding and, and resources, and whether that's contract dollars or people. Um, that that obviously can always help. Uh, absent those sorts of, of congressional interventions. Uh, you know, opportunities to move things faster. Sometimes if we're talking about rulemaking, for example, um, sometimes using shorter, shorter comment periods uh, can allow for uh, a faster turnaround on, on rulemaking uh, and opportunities where um, we sometimes can examine uh, which rulemakings are more likely to be able to move uh, quicker in terms of our um, expected ability to, to complete work uh, in terms of performance research. Uh, it's always something we're looking to undertake. Um, so, you know, we're, we're always going to be sort of re-examining opportunities to accelerate work, but it, importantly, making sure we're, we're making all of our statutory findings, regulatory findings with respect to um, producing performance standards that, you know, protect the public, but also can withstand uh, any challenge. Well, I look forward to that discussion. Um, I do want to hear from my, my fellow commissioners, so I am going to turn to Commissioner Feldman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Levine, uh, for your presentation and to all staff that uh, that that put uh, a lot of effort into uh, getting this document in front of us for our consideration. Um, Mr. Levine, I, I wanted to start off by asking about the top line numbers that uh, that, that we're basing this plan off of. Um, and, and the question is, why are we keying the, the sort of best case top line number off of the FY23 request, which Congress has already considered and, and, and rejected? Wouldn't we be doing ourselves a, a little bit more of a favor in terms of uh, planning uh, in, in the realm of, of what we're likely to get in avoiding uh, uh, another difficult round of, of, of mid-year decisions where we have to contemplate cuts, uh, were we to key that off of, I, for example, the house mark, even that would represent uh, about a 20% increase. Thank you for the question. Um, although I, I, I would slightly disagree that, that Congress has rejected uh, the, the offer since we don't have a full year yet, we don't know what our full year would be, but, but fully recognizing um, it, it is a number that is it exceeds what has been proposed, at least so far, 
uh, by the House or the Senate. The, the reason um, the but, sort of but 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 Mr. Levine, the, they're out with the, the the marks already. We submitted our FY23 request. The House came out with 166.3 million. The Senate was at 153. Uh, you know, out of that, they've 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 shown their whole card on this. No, no, there's no question. It is, it is unlikely that we will receive that number. But technically speaking, we haven't we haven't received anything other than 190, 139. But I, I but I do want to answer your question, which which is which is this is an important one. Um, the reason we use the the 23 budget request figure is, is because it is the last approved figure uh, for from the commission uh, for which we are moving forward in terms of a planning process. Um, at the same time, recognizing the reality of where our current funds are, which is the 139 number, uh, it, it's our hope that um, uh, instead of a circumstance where we are engaged and trying to withdraw uh, items that uh, are not able to be funded, we will be adding to this process at the mid-year. So, in other words, in the document itself, nothing passed, and I want to make sure I have the right uh, page area or, or for you, um, but nothing that is laid out in the document essentially passed table two. Uh, so if you start sort of at, at OS 20 or page 11, um, all of those projects are contemplated under the, the CR level. Um, yep. And so any additional funding we'd be getting would be um, adding to that when we talk about mid year as opposed to with, uh, you know, withdrawing. Reduct or reducing, if that makes sense. Is, is that I, I understand that. I I I think it 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 may well be foolish to move forward with a a top line number assumed at at, at again a, a number that that Congress has has already considered uh, and and rendered some judgment on. Uh, I think that the the best that that that, that we could expect for uh, would be the house market one sixty six point three. Uh, that represents at least a number that's within the realm of, of realistic possibility. We asked for a significantly higher number. I, I think Congress came back and, and, and frankly, I don't need to give a civics lesson here and who controls both branches of government right now. Uh, but, but they came back with, uh, with, with, with a, uh, a, a determination that we haven't earned that higher number. Um, moving on. I, I, I also have a question about how staff is calculating the cost of FTEs. In, in the document, I, I see, for example, on uh, page OS 14, um, there's a summary increasing uh, uh, legal capacity uh, in the draft plan that complement, uh, contemplates $900,000 uh, for this project, uh, including funding two FTEs. We were told previously, I believe at the mid year, that the cost of FTEs was uh, assumed at, at about $200,000 uh, per attorney to increase this kind of capacity. Um, if, if it's accurate, this would represent a 125% increase from what we were told at mid year. Um, and throughout the document, there are some examples of arithmetic ambiguity and I'm having trouble, frankly, crosswalking between uh, what I'm seeing uh, on the tables in terms of headcounts and the amounts that would be used for other purposes. So, uh, Mr. Levine, this is, this is to you and, and maybe also to Mr. Baker. Is there a commission wide metric? Uh, on the cost of an FTE that, that's assumed in this document? Yes, uh, and I think I can also answer, um, at least generally speaking, perhaps why it's not as clear as it could be. So the, the commission-wide metric is about 1.9, or sorry, um, yeah, 190,000 190, per FTE uh, is the commission-wide metric. Um, that's excluding ARPA. Uh, and, but in terms of the um, what's built into the op plan uh, FTE estimates, but when you see, for example, the the, the example you reference on the on, on the bottom of OS fourteen or page five uh, of the plan, 0. 0.9 million including right. FTE, two FTEs. You know, th those are there. There's additional uh, maybe contract support. Uh, and, you know, it, it's not exclusively. Uh, those wouldn't be exclusively FTEs. Uh, in that example, and I think yeah, and I understand it, could, it. It it does say including. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I guess you know it, you you said it. These are your words that, that this isn't as as clear as it could be. Um, if I'm having trouble walking through this, and listen, I'm 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 not the best at math, 
uh, but but did spend a, a good deal of time yesterday with uh, with with the pencil and the calculator trying to walk through these numbers and make sense of it. If I can't make sense of it, uh, you know, th this this is a, a a document that Congress is also going to take a look at. Uh, you know, I think all of us believe uh, that this agency can do more with more resources. Again, I, I think we need to, to to make a case that uh, that 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 we're spending these dollars responsibly, and I think a key part of that is putting together a document and a plan. Um, that that spells out uh, it, 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 as as clear as we possibly can uh, where every single dollar is going towards. So to to that end, uh, you know, recognizing that a lot of these product uh, projects are are uh, uh, including sort of additional money uh, over and beyond what we would be spending on FTEs. And I appreciate the clarification on on the assumed FTE cost that we're basing this on. I think that, that should be spelled out clearly in the document, but. And it's it probably unfair to ask you now uh, to, to 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 provide the breakdown. But you know, as we're going through these projects, you know, can can you provide us with a, a breakdown of how much of the funding would be going to the FTEs themselves, and uh, you know, the, the the remainder of the funding, uh, which I assume is going to infrastructure and contract dollars and things like that. What percentage of that is is going to to to, to those, so that we can just have a better sense of tracking, sort of where the dollars are. Yeah, I, I don't think that'd be terribly difficult, but let me get back to you. I appreciate that. Um, I, I, I want to be respectful of the time and, and Mr. Chairman, you, you mentioned a second round. I think I get time probably to get 1 more question in and, and, and then may want to take you up on that second round. Uh, but Mr. Levine on, on table 1, uh, the, the draft plan lists 539 FTEs um, and it's not clear to me. Uh, whether we actually have 539 employees right now, or, or rather that's the maximum level of FTEs that are contemplated under the plan. Um, you know, can, can you let us know and tell us today what, what, what our current headcount is in terms of FTEs? And given our current staffing level, uh, does the 25 FTE reduction that's mentioned um, on, on table one, is that is that a reduction that's reflecting actual jobs lost, or or is that sort of subsumed into existing vacancies? I'm 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 not entirely clear on that. Sure, no, I appreciate the question. Um, and and again, it's it's always um, because hiring is always ongoing. It's always sort of a snapshot in time. Uh, but uh, briefly, the the 539 again is is right as a is a full time equivalence level, so it's not necessarily. People, right? There, we, you know, there are there are half time people, um, but that's the planned number for which we aim to achieve uh, at any given moment. That number, because of attrition, because we're in the midst of, of undertaking hiring, may be lower than that. Um, and again, I, I do want to make clear this is the non ARPA included uh, number. I think at the moment we are right around 510 or 515 people as of. Or FTEs, I should say, as of today, um, with a number of, you know, again, there's always ongoing hiring uh, with some folks currently in the queue uh, in terms of that process. And, you know, people always leave as well. But I think right at the moment, we're probably closer to that 514. Okay, so uh, we're at right about 514 right now. We're right around that, again, you know, when the document is printed versus today. But um, yeah, it's right, right around in, in, in that range. Um, but when we talk about the impact, it would be the inability to continue to fill those. You know, we're we're actively uh, under normal budgetary circumstances trying to fill up those five. You know, we need all those bodies uh, and all those positions filled uh, to undertake the work. Um, so it would have an impact on either uh, future hiring or um, you know current process. Again, work to be a full year CR. I appreciate that. Uh, Mr. Levine, thank you. I, I see that that's my 10 minutes. Uh, uh, I, I do have more questions, so perhaps we'll do a, a, a round two. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Thank you for being cognizant of time. Uh, Commissioner Trumpka. Thank you. Um, well, first of all, this operating plan signals a very strong path forward for this agency. It's full of new ideas and bold efforts to save lives, and it, it looks very good. And when I see these plans, I mean, it's, it's clear that this agency is grossly underfunded. This agency's earned more and it deserves more so that we can save lives, but we're stuck with the hand that we're currently dealt. Um, so I did wanna ask a few questions um, 
within the plan, I was really encouraged to see the uh, the references throughout to our continued efforts efforts on AI and machine learning. And I wanted to follow up on one project in that space that we had a lot of extra funds to in the mid year, the SAS via update. Uh, can you provide an update on, on what we've done with that and, and any increased capabilities we may have gained so far? Sure, thank you. Thank you for the question and, and thanks to the commission for that funding. Uh, we, we are currently in the process of installing uh, the SAS via environment as a reminder uh, for, for everyone, uh, it's, it's a cloud based environment, um, which has a variety of components that need to be integrated for us to be able to use it in a way that allows that AI and, and machine learning to help us, uh, with, with reporting require with, with analysis and reporting. Um, so we're, we're currently working on the installation uh, and integration uh, of, of the environment. We are expecting that to be finalized early this fiscal year, maybe uh, in terms of calendar wise early next calendar year. So, you know, somewhere in the 2nd quarter, uh, we've, we are already on uh, undergoing training uh, for staff to be able to start to use it as it is integrated in a way that allows us to take full advantage uh, uh, of the environment. So we're, we're making progress. We're not there yet, but we're making progress. No, that sounds great. I, I appreciate that update. Um, it's also great that we're going to be working on PFAS this year. I think we absolutely need to. Can you explain a little bit about, uh, it looks like our work seems to be focused on PFAS's impact on indoor air quality. And, and I'm wondering, is that the biggest risk that we're concerned about with PFAS? Because my mind jumps to, you know, risks of ingestion and leaching and skin absorption from clothing and things like that. So can you explain the relative risks of PFAS in the air versus ingestion versus contact? And, and are we going to be addressing all these areas? Sure, uh, the um, it's important work and, and the indoor exposure work, uh, I, I think it's it's worth noting includes each of those exposure routes you just mentioned when we're evaluating the exposure and the toxicity related to, to, the, to the compounds. Um, our current work is, as you know, we're working with a contractor directs us to do a, a complete overview uh, on PFAS chemistries, their sources, their uses. Um, we're working with the Environmental Protection Agency and other federal agencies uh, to get more information on the usage of the chemicals uh, in order to be able to evaluate how we can take action uh, on consumer product safety hazards and not just sort of be aware of the existence of the chemicals. Uh, so it's, it, is, it, is a, it is a means to an end uh, is probably another way of looking at it. Okay, that's that's great. So it sounds like we we are approaching all those areas, and that's really encouraging to hear. Um, do you know when we expect that that work to be completed? Um, well, you know, I mean, there's thousands of different PFAS um, chemicals, so and there are different properties and different products. So I don't know. I'm not sure that there's a specific completion date. I mean, our work is ongoing. Um, the, the the one of the current contracts are working under will be completed this fiscal year uh, in terms of um, their, their their literature research and their other research to help us identify action steps. And then the plan is to come back with a request for information uh, out to the public uh, and, and stakeholders to build upon what we've learned from, from that work. Um, Again, as I mentioned, there's the interagency work, which is going to be ongoing, you know, far, far longer and far better resourced out of EPA uh, than we have that opportunity. But, you know, we're, we're working within, within our construct um, to at least make use of the response we hope to, we, we expect to receive this year uh, from, from the contract work. Okay. And, and I'm really glad to hear that we are working with other regulators here because it seems like there are a lot of people who are working in the same space and it makes sense to borrow intelligence where we're not having to duplicate it. Um, you know, I know that, that state regulators are moving forward on addressing the issue. EPA has announced plans to ban it entirely in water uh, and the European Commission is also moving forward. So the extent we can collaborate, it's great. It's great to hear we're already contemplating that. Um, so the, the indoor air quality work that, that that's going to be done this fiscal year, if that uncovers some actionable problem, how quickly could we move towards rulemaking on that? Well, 
really hard to speculate um, because it depends on what that actionable item is. Um, and it would, you know, require as as we go through this process, you know, at this point in the in, in the fiscal year, and as we do again at mid year, uh, evaluating available resources and, and where we want to to put those efforts. I and mean, to put it in some level of context, you know, our health sciences departments, a limited number of toxicologists uh, who are not only working on this, you know, they're working on uh, OF on, on organic organohalogen flame retardants. They're working on crumb rubber issues. They're working on you know, a variety of chemical uh, chemical work um, and, and other compounds. So, um, and, and, you know, a relatively new project is chronic work on gas appliance, chronic hazards from gas appliances. Um, so, were we to to come upon actionable information, uh, obviously we'd present to to the commission options in terms of what what we could and couldn't do, and what we would have to um, again back to the chair's question earlier reshuffle to. Um, to raise something up uh, to move more quickly. Well, you know, I hope this is one of those areas where the collaborative process with with other agencies work in the same space might help short circuit that process a little bit if we see that we need to do something there. So, um, ho hopefully, that's a thought going forward. Um, quick question on on I see we're doing work on fire hazards and mattress flammability and mattress pad flammability. Um, there there is a concern that I've heard about. Manufacturers moving to towards fiberglass and other things to meet those flammability standards, and I wanted to see if, as part of our work here, we're also looking at those types of potentially toxic exposures, things like endocrine disruptors that we might be exposed to as a result. Um, so, I mean, the the, the there's, there's two answers to that. I, you know, we continue to have in the past and continue to look at flame retardant chemical hazards. Um, and that's, you know, again, back to that, back to that list I was just going to before, you know, within that limited group of folks that we have in health sciences, you know, looking at toxic flame retardants is, is one of the, you know, one of the ongoing projects. That said, the specific project that you're referring to, the 1632 uh, mattress uh, smoldering standard uh, update, test update, is not specifically geared uh, to examine this you know the, the that particular issue um it's it's more working on uh flammability testing uh to try and limit the number of mattresses catching on fire uh which lead to you know unfortunately several hundred deaths a year um so it's so it's a yes and a not exactly this project okay okay uh yes is good <laughs> um so question on is, I think it's great. So I saw that we have a measure uh, for the effectiveness of our voluntary standards work, which is which is excellent that we're measuring. And, and that performance measure looks at the number of standards that we participate in that lead to a change in the voluntary standard that will result in less people being injured. And our current goal there is success in 16 out of the 87 voluntary standards that we participate in, which is 18.4%. And, and I'm I'm assuming and I'm I, I'm sure that we've been more successful than 18% of the time. And I'd love to reflect our success with an increased target there. And you know, to bring it in line with other measures, I, I, I'd like love to listen to you as to as to what that might be. But you know, if you bring it in line with other targets, something like 90% would be fantastic to see. But I, I'd like to hear back from you on that. Um, and, and I think we should also make this a key performance measure. That way, you know, instead of measuring just the number we're participating in, if we measure success, it's actually reflecting value added by staff. So I don't expect an answer to a perfect number there, but maybe you could follow up to me with some thoughts on what could be a more appropriate percentage for that measure. Sure, we appreciate it. I mean, I, I you know, I'd note we are, um, we believe significantly successful in helping to guide voluntary standards to be better and help protect more consumers in addition, obviously, of course, to our significant mandatory standards work. But there are um, some that uh, allow for greater increases in success in terms of safety than others, just in terms of sort of where they are in their scope, uh, our involvement levels. Uh, but yeah, we'd be happy to come back and, and discuss. Excellent. And, and my time is up. I think um, since Commissioner Feldman brought up a second round, I might uh, join in as well. 
Thanks for being cognizant of time, Commissioner. Uh, Commissioner Boyle. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Mr. Levine, for this uh, very thorough and um, helpful presentation. And of course, to all the staff, I know how much work they're going to put in together to make these documents. So thank you to everyone. Uh, a top priority of the agency, and certainly for me, has been uh, making sure that we have safe sleep environments for babies and children. So I do have a number of questions to see what we will be doing to build on the work that we've already done in that area. Um, so I would like to ask on page three under the applied research um, bullet, there's a reference to safe sleep practices uh, that's been uh, funded in the FY23 budget request. Uh, and I just like you to elaborate on what that would be uh, and whether there's going to be any work done uh, if we don't uh, achieve the um, optimistic budget level uh, for the 23 budget. Sure. Thank you for the question. Obviously, a top priority for everyone. Um, you know, unfortunately, this project uh, and, and, you know, all these bullets, all, all these, you know, one, two, three, and four on that page. Um, would not be funded under under the CR level, so that specifically referenced activity would not uh, be funded, on, you know, under under this level. However, um, there is um, a other other work going on uh, in that space. Uh, whether we're talking about you know enforcement of the infant sleep product rule, enforcement of the Safe Babies Act, um, working on the no proposed rulemaking for bassinets. Infant pillows, nursing pillows, uh, and our ongoing voluntary standards work on durable nursery products um, would be all unaffected uh, by a lack of receiving the fund. I'm trying to put it in the positive, uh, lack of receiving the funding uh, as contemplated in the 23 request. Are there other contract vehicles in place now in 22 that would contemplate this type of work that we're, we could use to um, yes. achieve those goals? Yes, there, there's there's two uh, that come to mind. Um, there's one working on seated infant project, uh, seated infant products. Pardon me, um, which is a both a biomechanical and a human subject study um, that's focused on determining characteristics that may pose hazards, um, developing recommendations based on that research uh, and testing. As I said, you know, with human with with infants, that was funded in 22. Uh, that's an ongoing project that will be un, 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 no, unaffected uh, by uh, by a lack of, of you know, that's funded under the 139. Better way to say it. Uh, and another one is we're also doing a, a child. Just, one second, just on that one, and yeah. what's the what's the timeline? What do we expect to um, come from that contract uh, in terms of actionable items? Sure. Uh, so the timeline is we're expecting some results. Uh, it's not the full results. I don't want to promise the full results, but I believe some, but I think all the results uh, this fiscal year, uh, I want to say in the spring, I'll circle back with you uh, if I'm wrong. Um, and the, there is the, the utility uh, of, of this study we're hoping would be both of use in a regulatory uh, framework in terms of looking at, at infant sleep products and, and related products, as well as potentially uh, in, in an enforcement perspective. Uh, when we talk about um, some of our new authorities and uh, looking at um, design uh, as one of the, the characteristics um, uh, within safe sleep, safe sleep for babies um, and infant sleep products. Okay, thank you. I'm sorry I interrupted you. No, no, that, that's quite all right. The, the other one I was just going to mention is we're we're also uh, funded for there's an ongoing uh, work uh, on children's strength uh, in terms of how to use that for standards. Um, I need to get a little more information for you on that, but that's with uh, the University of Michigan uh, that we're undertaking that. Okay, thank you. Yes. Uh, for, uh, another question I just have, I think, as much of a clarification as anything. Um, the uh, if uh, it looks like we are working on uh, an infant pillow ban, uh, and at the same time we are listing that as a voluntary standard uh, activity. So I'm wondering how to square that. And if you could just talk in general, I think there's some confusion about the difference between what we're doing in the infant pillow world and the nursing pillow world. And if you could just uh, address those issues, I appreciate it. Sure, I will. I will do my best. Um, so these these are projects that are. Plan to go on concurrently uh, in, in terms of the work within the voluntary standard activity. Pardon me, as well as um, the, the regulatory activity 
um, the the per, the exact parameters of, of how our um, work uh, exactly what our standards are going to look like are still being developed. Uh, but there's a, a recognition of a need to address what are measurable hazards, uh, and and we'll be looking to um, undertake that mandatory rulemaking at the same time uh, as as we traditionally have, and particularly because of the way the statute uh, essentially requires uh, the work with the voluntary standards community. We'll be on, uh, undertaking similar work uh, within voluntary standards. Um, on the nursing pills, I mean, it, it, I think the at, at a macro level, what we're interested in doing is developing requirements that prevent babies um, from being exposed to unreasonable risk of suffocation when using either of these products. Um, and so, when we're talking about the, the nursing feeding pillows or the infant pillows, which sometimes referred to as loungers, um, either of those are are they're separate products. I think one of the important pieces that we're hoping will be accomplished from the infant pillow ban work that's listed there is making clear what is and what is not subject to that um, the, the ban. I think there's been some uh, some confusion in the regulated community uh, as to what fits in and what what is excluded from that construct. Uh, and so we believe that that will also be of assistance uh, in making clear everyone, manufacturers and most importantly consumers, are aware of what is in and what is out. Okay, thank you. So just to clarify, uh, on page 12, it refers to infant support pillows, but in the mandatory standards table, it just says infant pillows. Is there a difference? I just want to make sure I'm looking at the same looking at the same language you're looking at. Give me one second. Page 12. And the priority activity. Um Well, I mean, in the, oh, the 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 bullet that starts with focus on hazards to children. Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, infant support pillows and nursing support products are two separate products. Um, Correct. I, what I'm saying is that you it refers to infant support pillows here, but on, I think on the mandatory standards table, it just says infant pillows. Oh, oh, yeah. So I, I believe that's just. Not enough room in the table. Uh, those, that is the same product. Okay. I just, there has been some confusion. So I just think uh, making sure we track it the same way is helpful. Yep. And if we need to go back and make sure that we are being consistent, we will okay. go ahead and take a look at that. All righty. Thank you so much. Um, just in general, can you tell me how staff does develop these priority plays for EFHR? Uh, how uh, the priority activities get identified? In general, sure. yeah, I, I mean, I, you know, it, it's a, it's a as, as you're aware, it's a multi uh, faceted process, which includes um, looking, of course, at something like um, the, the approved performance budget request, looking at uh, the, the 22, uh, the work that was undertaken in 22 and, and what is, you know, was conceived of as multi year projects, whether we're talking about in the rulemaking construct or. The IT construct um, that you asked about EXHR specifically. So let's say in the rulemaking construct, if something you know was started as a as an NPR, you know there's sort of a presumption that the, the goal is to move forward uh, with, with a final rule. The draft strategic plan, as mentioned, uh, is is a, a, a you know is a foundational uh, undergirding for a lot of this in terms of trying to build in those top level concepts and priorities. Um, and, you know, on a much more practical level, what are the product safety hazards, which we can address, uh, based on the, you know, the existing resources that we have, uh, within our statutory authority. Um, I hope that answers the question. Yes, it does. Thank you. I see, uh, my time is up and I think I'll join the uh, chorus of requests for additional plans. Thank you, commissioner. Let's start our next round of questions. Um, recognizing that everybody wanted around, I want to defer to, to those who are here. So I turn back to Commissioner Feldman. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Levine, uh, I want to go back to table one. I had some additional questions um, and I'm, I'm looking at where it lists 46 FTEs as part of the uh, FY 2023 ARPA costs. 
Um, I want to unpack that a little bit. D does that represent a net increase? Uh, is this gross FTEs that's not accounting for any staff uh, turnover or retention or attrition issues that, that we may have run into uh, along the way? Um, and sort of more basically, are we shifting the net FTE level uh, from our, our, our baseline number to ARPA to protect the current staffing levels or not? I, I just, if, if you could unpack a little bit about what's going on with, uh, with, with that 46 number. Sure, absolutely. The um, similar to the to the conversation uh, we were just having about the five thirty nine, um, it is a um, it is a planned goal number uh, that um, we are aiming to achieve. I believe right now uh, we're at forty five, um, for example. So. Um, that's, you know, that is the number that is based on the approved plan uh, from earlier this spring um, uh, from, from the commission. So the plan is, it's 46, uh, right? So, so I guess that answers the, what, what's the, is that an onboard or a goal number? I think it's a goal number. Okay. It might be closer to 42, but we're, we're, in the, we're in the 40s and looking to maintain that, you know, the goal is to maintain that 46. Um, if, we're base, if we're baselining uh, some ARPA money, but then also um, coming in with with sort of new ARPA targets or, or, or goals, um, can you talk a little bit about where that leaves us in terms of sort of projected ARPA burn and and you know when, when we would expect those funds to be fully expended um, throughout their life? Is this is this a glide path through sort of the expiration of those funds or? So um, I believe the uh, the plan has contemplated again, not if we do not receive any additional funds which result in a transfer uh, over to our base budget. Um, there's uh, the the plan as contemplated gets us to um, somewhere in fiscal 2025 uh, in terms of. Um, depleting what we, you know, all, all of the funds based on the current plan. Uh, I, I don't have the exact in front of me, but it's, it's in fiscal 25. And again, okay. that presumes no additional, you know, no ability to transfer funds. Understood. I appreciate that clarification. Thank you. Um, uh, I, I, I'm pleased in reading through the plan uh, to see that, uh, that, that excess and uh, this is sort of for, for, Mr. Jaholski, and I'm not sure if he's on, uh, but 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 Jason, you as well. Uh, that that Access is recommending uh, increasing its key performance measure uh, for the number of uh, import examinations completed. Uh, the 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 team's previous target had been uh, 40,000 uh, inspections, uh, uh, and we're now looking at uh, at, at, at 45,000 for the current fiscal. Um, and I, I think this is moving in the right direction. Uh, I think it's the kind of metric that we can uh, take back to Congress to demonstrate. Uh, to, to them and to the American public, uh, how we're using these ARPA funds and the return on investment that uh, that, that American consumers are getting uh, for, for the ARPA investment that they've that they've made in in, in the agency. Um, so, uh, uh, Mr. Levine and, and certainly Mr. Jaholski, I, I do want to thank you uh, for your leadership in this regard and, and to congratulate uh, uh, Access and, and, and the entire team uh, for the work that, that they're doing on our front lines. Um, I did also have some questions about uh, some of the OCM uh, uh, spending that was contemplated. I, I I know that OCM, Mr. Levine, doesn't report to you. Should I direct those uh, uh, questions at you? I, I don't know if Ms. Springs was on to, to answer questions. I believe she is. I'm happy to try and answer, but I'm sure Ms. Springs will also be happy to answer. I'm here. Well, thank okay, you. okay, terrific. Thank you. Um, so I, I was hoping that you could discuss the, the contemplated FTE level for, for OCM under this plan. Um, it, it appears that, that staff is proposing uh, to shift two FTEs uh, uh, in, into ARPA and then to eliminate two others. And I'm curious where these four positions are, 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 are going and, and uh, you know, similar to the question I asked earlier, uh, what, what the current staffing level is uh, for, for the OCM office. Yeah, currently I, uh, are, we are staffed at uh, 13 FTEs. Okay. Uh, I believe two of those are ARPA 
um, ARPA funded positions. Um, I would view uh, those positions as, you know, helping to, um, you know, helping to, to drive the broad consumer education um, uh, priorities, the seasonal and the episodic consumer educations, uh, education programs that we're trying to, um, to, to address. Um, someone has just messaged me that my camera's off. I, I'm assuming you don't, you don't mind, uh, Commissioner. I, I just appreciate the answer. Thank you. Okay. Yes. Um, yeah. So that's, you know, we would be hoping to drive the, the broad consumer um, education that, that I've been charged with um, advancing, you know, the programmatic work, you know, we have great folks, um, you know, internally that, that are handling that uh, along with our agency of record. But where I see my, my value is in, you know, providing that broad consumer education that makes the, the Consumer Product Safety Commission a household work. Household name. Totally agree and appreciate the work that, that you are doing. Um, I mean, to the extent that we're talking about um, a, a, a reduction in FTEs for 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 OCM under the plan, um, you know, in the in the the putting together this draft, did, did you consider lowering the external campaign budget uh, uh, to bring some of that work internal um, so that we're protected and your team in, in particular is protected ag uh, against uh, any potential reduction in force. Well, certainly, I think it's something that that I'd be, you know, more than happy to to discuss. Um, I'll, I'll be I'll be candid that I had not had that particular thought, but I'm happy to discuss it. Okay, um, perhaps this becomes an ongoing discussion then. Um, I, I also had some it. concerns and some questions, frankly, about uh, concerns may, may be too strong uh, about the the three hundred thousand dollars that's contemplated uh, to purchase a mass um, emailing system. I, I assume that this spend. Uh, would would uh, would focus on uh, purchasing mass distribution email lists. Um, isn't that something that we should be relying on our external communications firm to assist with, and perhaps being able to do so under their existing contract? Uh, uh, candidly, this is the you know the the three hundred thousand is um, a separate entity. Um, the, it's uh, the, the company is called Granicus, um, and I'm not sure that it, this is something that we want our external PR firm. Um, frankly, I'm not can't I'm not sure that they would have that level of expertise. Um, Granicus is showing great um, you know great results. They have um, you know they have been helping to helping us to to distribute recall notices. We've we've experienced a tremendous. Um, you know, pr tremendous uh, uptick in, uh, in, in uh, uh, you know, sends and um, in performance in that area. Our email list, uh, subscriber list has grown from 8,000 to 30, you know, more than 30,000 inside of a year. So I think that, you know, that uh, providing additional funds for that, you know, for that effort with a company that has, you know, a demonstrated expertise and demonstrated yeah. performance is is worth it. I, I appreciate that, and and thank you for the response. I, I do want to keep um, sort of the, the 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 focus and and our eye on the ultimate goal here, um, with with everything that OCM uh, accomplishes, and, and frankly, uh, consistent with with the the overall mission of the agency, which is you know what are we doing to ultimately change behaviors. Um, is there any evidence that that with 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 Graticus and 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 uh, uh, you know perhaps external studies to validate? Is there anything that that you can point to uh, that that speaks to whether a mass mailing and, and sort of mass email distribution is actually effective in uh, in, in in improving safety and changing consumer behavior? So, to the extent that you know someone. Uh, taking the action of signing up for us for our newsletters, signing up after they receive a recall notice, um, signing up after they receive an initial email inviting them to subscribe to saferproducts.gov. I would say that that would be, you know, we we can't, um, you know, we can't guarantee what consumers do with the information, but the fact that they, you know, take the action to learn more, to contact us, to at, join our email list. For me, is is a uh, a safe indication and a positive and encouraging sign that you know our messaging is resonating and that um, people want to know more. 
I appreciate that. I see that my, my time has expired. Uh, and uh, I, I thank you for the response. Thanks for answering my questions. Uh, and Mr. Chairman, uh, thank you and, uh, and staff for, for putting this on. Uh, I'll yield the balance of my time, which I've already exceeded. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Feldman. Commissioner Trumka. Thank you. Uh, so I think this is a narrow question. I was happy to see that we're doing the review of the firewall lab strategy. And uh, I, I see that we're going to be getting a briefing package this year, but I just wanted to verify the language says review, but that if there are action items that we staff thinks we should be taking, those will be recommended in that package as well, right? Yeah, I mean, to the extent we find items that uh, would allow the commission to take action, those will be, yes, absolutely presented in the package. Just wanted to verify that. Uh, so, I, you know, taking a look at the mandatory standards table, it's the one on OS 30 in the package, this is a really robust plan to work on a lot of mandatory standards this year, and I am very encouraged by the list. And I think it's clear that we're going to save a lot of the lives with the work that we're going to do this year. Uh, and I absolutely want to make sure that we give staff of this agency absolutely everything we need to accomplish the items on that list. Uh, my first question is, are we confident that we're going to be able to uh, accomplish everything on this list? Um. You know, that's certainly the goal. Uh, it's it's as as you mentioned, um, and I think a lot of different adjectives have been used. It's it's aggressive. It's ambitious, it's robust. Um, you know, our goal uh, is to to meet the list as proposed. Um, we believe it is uh, achievable, but it is um, uh, it is aggressive, ambitious, and robust. And and you know, sometimes all the stars need to align to get everything over the finish line. Uh, within that 12 month period, certainly, um, uh, it's our hope that we can get it across. How do we go about predicting our ability to do that? I mean, do we go through an exercise where we, you know, uh, estimate the total number of staff hours that each action might take so that we can budget staff time over the course of the year? Yeah, I, I mean, that's, that is, um. A key piece of of the process uh, part of the process is based on sort of a uh, working knowledge of uh, the types of rules uh, that generate um, significant stakeholder comment response, uh, which would then necessitate significant uh, response from the agency uh, in the rulemaking package versus those that may be less likely to generate that sort of response. So that's you know, a lot, a lot of, uh, a lot of time needs to be taken uh, in, in constructing and, and, and answering those, those comments uh, from, from, from stakeholders. Um, so, you know, that, that's another piece of it, sort of our familiarity with uh, the stakeholder community is often um, uh, it brought to an advantage by uh, perhaps our work in a voluntary standard to the extent it exists with a given mandatory standard. So, um, you know, and I think the other sort of un, uh, unpredictable piece of this is what are the emerging issues that uh, crop up over, over the next 12 months? Uh, you know, whether it be um, enforcement work uh, that uh, necessitates more support than anticipated from, uh, from, from the folks in the XHR or uh, a new congressional mandate uh, or existing statutory timelines that are um, you know, we're aware of, but, you know, kick in when um, a durable nursery infant product, for example, that maybe we weren't expecting to um, to come forward with an update comes forward. Uh, so, you know, generally speaking, it, you know, again, yeah, it's based on sort of a, a, an understanding of about how long things take um, uh, based on history and based on, on current projections. But, the, you know, the unknown out there always has a dramatic impact on our ability to move things across. Sure, sure. And, and look, I know you're not going to be able to provide this off offhand, uh, but I think it'd be very helpful for us as as commissioners to know how large of a lift each of these activities that we're thinking about here, uh, how much each one is. So if you could provide us with the estimated number of staff hours, however you map that number out, you know, for, for the next year uh, for each of these items on the list, is, is that something you could provide? Uh, we can come back and take a look at it. I mean, I think what's important to understand is that some staff is fungible and some isn't. Um, and so, you know, the same eight hours isn't always the same eight hours, uh, depending on, you know, there's only one or two people who work on a project and you know, one of those one or those one or two people retires. Uh, that's different than something that perhaps 
a variety for people could pick up and work on. Um, but we'll come back and, and make sure that you have anything you need to sort of understand the scope. Great, and absolutely understand that that they might may not be fungible. But I think that top line understanding of you know, this one's going to take four times as long as this other one would just be useful as as we're thinking through each of those items on the list. Um, okay, so I, I wanted to to look at a few of the specific mandatory item or items on the mandatory standards list, and and one is our rule to implement the Safe Sleep for Babies Act. And I wanted to verify that the comment period on that one has closed. So we're currently in the process of reviewing and considering comments on that one, right? I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Ted. Sorry. I'm just just the, the Safe Sleep for Babies Act, the implementing regulation on that. It's on our mandatory standards list. The comment period's closed. So we're in the period where we're, we're reviewing those comments. I'm sorry. Yes, correct. Yes. Um, and and I, you know, I've looked at them and we've gotten some thought provoking comments to that rule. And mm -hmm. some commenters suggest that Congress dictated a very broad scope to the rule, one that includes, among other things, rockers. And I, I wouldn't want to prejudge the outcome of our analysis on the Safe Sleep for Babies Act implementing regulations. I think certainly we all agree we need to give those comments full consideration. And so I think it may be premature to list a 104 NPR for infant rockers for fiscal year 23, as we do in, in this mandatory standards table, because that would presume that those products aren't in scope for Safe Sleep for Babies Act, but I don't think we're in a position to make that assumption. And so the more prudent course there may be to remove the rocker NPR now and re-examine the need for a rocker's NPR in the mid-year update to the operating plan, because at that point we might not need it. And, and But if there is a need, we could add it at that point, and it would also free up some of these valuable rulemaking resources for other priorities in the meantime that we've been talking about. So no question there, just, just my thoughts on that issue. I did have a question on the measure for the recall response rate and, and on OS40. And we set our goal for recall response rate at 25%. Uh, but we've actually been significantly outperforming that number. And in both 2020 and 2021, we did a great job and, and we hit 33% recall effectiveness. So I think we should raise the bar to reflect that success. And, and I was curious what staff's position would be on how high we could go to reflect not only our new normal, but maybe to motivate us to go higher as well. Sure. So I, you know, I appreciate the question. And obviously, you know, recall response is something that's top of mind for, for everyone. Uh, it's something that you know, a lot of people spend a lot of time um, working on. Our goal is to get dangerous products out of the hands of consumers. Um, that's the purpose uh, of recalls, and so certainly uh, everyone's goal is is to have that achieved. I think uh, the the question that you raised, which is a good one, is you know what is the best means to measure that? Uh, what is the best way in which we can um, determine uh, the success of those activities? And and historically, that's been a very difficult question to raise. And and some of these metrics get um, uh, can be can be uh, altered. With uh, you know one big recall that is very successful, or one big in terms of, of of being able to measure that response, I think that's an important piece of it. Or one that is um, difficult to measure the response of can really um, impact this sort of numbers. Because remember, it's only the ones what this is measuring is only the ones for which we have a returned or a response directly to a manufacturer as to what the disposition of that product was. So. Um, you know, unlike, and, and I often use this example, unlike a, a motor vehicle, which has an individual vehicle identification number that allows for easy tracking uh, when you're talking about, uh, you know, a toaster, uh, people may just throw it out uh, and we'd have no way of knowing uh, that, um, that they took advantage of the remedy that they received our messaging. So we are always interested in trying to find ways to improve it. Uh, happy to discuss, you know, can, you know, are there ways to improve the goals uh, number? Uh, and, and we're also looking at how we can expand what we refer to as response rate, um, because maybe it's not just simply specifically responding to the exact offer of a remedy by the manufacturer, but it's something maybe a little broader or a little bit different or maybe two separate measures. So it's something that we are always thinking of ways to try and find uh, ways to improve, but uh, I certainly don't think it's a lack of effort. No, no, and certainly don't mean to suggest it is. In fact, the opposite, because we've been doing better than the measure. Um, but, but I think my point is, um, the 
acknowledging the problems with the measure aside that it is not a complete picture because some people will throw these things away that exists now and it existed three years ago when we used the same metric and two years ago so measuring ourselves on that same uh measure over time we could still change this to reflect that we've hit 33 percent instead of 25 the last two years and we hope to go higher uh and then we could also work together and I'm, I'm, i'd be happy to work together on on a way that we could better measure this um going forward so if you're not ready with a number now maybe we could follow up and see what would make sense for a number there sure absolutely happy to work with you. um and and last question that i had was on um it's it's one particular aspect of voluntary standards that I've been thinking about lately, and that's where we where we pass a mandatory rule and then continue participating in the voluntary standard thereafter. And I think one of the examples that kind of jumped out that might be a, a stark example of this would be magnets. And it's come to my attention that the discussions in the magnets meeting after we passed the rule have kind of broken down into, hey, what what kind of rule would we wish was in place if CPSC's rule didn't exist? That doesn't seem like a very effective use of time, and I'm not sure if if all <laughs> voluntary standards or many voluntary standards kind of devolve that rapidly after a mandatory rule. But question on that is: Should we consider pausing participation in, in voluntary standards work for a certain period after we've addressed the issue through a mandatory rule? Well, you know, I mean, there's always different ways the commission can approach this. I think historically, the um, the motivation to remain involved. Uh, with um, with voluntary standards activities, which remember sort of wax and wane in terms of activity following uh, a mandatory rule coming into a, coming into effect, but um, is everything from trying to help improve test methods, perhaps that uh, exceed or are um, yeah that exceed uh, where we are in terms of the mandatory in terms of the detail. Uh, is something that is easily more easily accomplished within the voluntary standards process than trying to consistently update uh, the mandatory rule making process. Um, there's a, um, you know, a, a, a history of voluntary standards having surpassed uh, where a mandatory standard is, depending upon the length, of course, uh, that mandatory standard is in place. Uh, and you know, we also want to be cautious as to not seeing um, something that, uh, in a voluntary standard context, um, strays too far away from where the mandatory standard is. Now, of course, we can enforce the mandatory standard, but even better if the entire industry is on board uh, with that standard. Now, all that said, mandatory standard is mandatory. We're going to enforce it as written. Um, but generally, it's a pretty small investment of time to keep a hand in uh, in those voluntary standards activities um, and, and trying to help guide them in a direction that is um, likely to result in more and better um, compliance and success in demonstrating that compliance. Uh, but, you know, th there's always exceptions to the rule. All right. That, that is all my questions. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Boyle. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Mr. Levine, certainly a, a hallmark of the agency that uh, we take great pride in is our data. Uh, and so I do want to ask you uh, a number of questions about our data and how we're working to improve it. I want to start with NICE. Um, I, I think one of the priority activities um, is, involves the FY21 NICE hospital sample modernization plan. So I'd like to just ask you uh, what the status of that is, particularly with respect to recruitment. I think uh, footnote nine references the need to add 20 to 30 hospitals to that sample. And so I would like to ask about the status of that, please. Sure, thank you for the question. And obviously it's, it is one of our most important um, programs and something that we all, we all wanna make sure is successful. Um, so we're we're currently in the second year of a contract with uh, a, a vendor who, who has been tasked with helping us to recruit new emergency room and new hospitals uh, to to nice um, this past year. So this is this this will be the second year. The first year was significantly impacted by the COVID Omicron spike. Just as they were getting up to speed, um, emergency rooms across the country, of course, were uh, inundated. Uh, in a way that seemed to have been quieting down and has um, an impact on our ability and their ability more specifically to um, to deal with the non-emergent issue, which you know, which becoming a nice 
hospital. So it's um, it, we are we are hopeful as we are seeing some more um, some, some some limited but more success in, in queuing up uh, some interested hospitals uh, over the last month or so. Um, the contract was extended at mid year for fiscal 23. Um, so we're certainly hoping to see more success this year out of the contractor with the recruiting. Um, that's where we currently are and, and, and certainly to the extent that uh, those efforts are unsuccessful, we will be taking on additional uh, steps. We're working with the American College of Emergency Physicians to try and um, use another methodology uh, in terms of recruitment. Um, staff undertake some of that recruitment as well. Can I just clarify um, how the funds um, are used for recruitment? Um, it looks like ARPA funds are used for the hospital sample modernization plan, but the recruitment is uh, at the CR level. Am I right on this? Um, yeah, so right, so, so the, the, the funds, as I mentioned, for the contractor that's doing the recruiting was funded at mid-year, um, so that wouldn't be impacted by the CR funding and uh, the, the modernization piece, which is the, on, on the contract technical end, uh, is, is funded out of uh, ARPA, so that also wouldn't be impacted by the CR level. That said, sort of future endeavors, uh, increased um, activity, whether it be contract support or on a staff level, uh, would be impacted by um, by a, a full year CR. Okay, well, I obviously NICE is one of the hallmark um, vehicles of our agency and whatever support uh, we need to give you all, I, I um, and behind that, so thank you for bringing me that update. Um, keeping on the data front, uh, the FY23 budget request also contemplates a significant increase in artificial intelligence. I think it's 5.6 million, and then another 0.4 million to enhance data to sharpen our focus on vulnerable populations. And again, uh, a similar question: Where would those priorities fall if we do not get that? Uh, enhanced budget uh, appropriation uh, as we are hoping to get. Yeah, well, I mean, the, the short answer is, um, were we to say at a full year CR and no funds would go to those projects as currently contemplated. Um, now, were there to be, again, some level between 139 and 195, uh, the commission you know, staff would propose um, some where where to out where where to, where to spend those additional resources. Uh, it's obviously a, a high higher priority project, uh, which is why it's listed here. That may that might, could be depending again on what those levels are. Uh, one of those things that are put forth to the commission uh, at a mid year concept. Okay, thank you. I actually have a, a sort of a specific uh, data question, and that relates to gender. Uh, we recently learned in the context of the adult portal, portable bed rails that the vast majority of victims were female and, and most of those incidents involved fatalities. And I wanted to ask if the agency was equipped to, um, with its, within its current resources, to conduct an analysis of other products to determine if there's a similar impact along, along gender lines and, and, you know, what the cause for that uh, disparity might be. Do we have the resources for that? So, you know, th this is a sort of yes and no uh, answer. I, you know, I, generally speaking, uh, for almost uh, all of our death um, and, and injury report data, we have at least some gender uh, specific information. So we generally have enough information to, to get to that first step of is there a gender disparity? Um, are, you know, and, and even sort of beyond simple demographics, uh, you know, certain older populations uh, are, are more weighted towards female, but even within that, um, you know, we have the ability to sort of to, to sort against percentages uh, because we do have that, that, that gender data. Um, unfortunately, beyond that sort of that first step, we generally don't have um, the resources or sufficient data to necessarily determine what is causing that disparity within a given product category. Um, we are conducting some, you know, some preliminary research um, on these sorts of questions, as we've done with uh, some of the recent epide epidemiological reports that we've put out, um, but quite frankly, we, we we would expect to need some of the analytics we would get from machine learning, uh, some of the projects we've been contemplating and discussing today, even uh, to help us make that next leap to you know 
getting behind those numbers? You know, why are we seeing those numbers? Okay, thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, I, I want to switch gears a little bit and um, uh, talk about bicycles. Uh, like many during the pandemic, I started to uh, ride a bicycle more, and I know people are turning to using bicycles for environmental reasons and because of gas prices. Uh, and so I do want to ask, and particularly about e-bikes, I know we just had a report that came out, our micromobility report came out yesterday, uh, and it showed that for all micromobility uh, products, there's uh, a significant increase in injuries and fatalities, but there's 129 fatalities for all across all products from 2017 to 2021. Um, so I, I think just in general, that's a concern that we really do need to um, put some thought and effort into, and I know that we are, but I uh, want to drill down a little bit on bicycles and ask um, how we are uh, enforcing, are the sets uh, um, requirements in our bicycle regulation at all adequate to deal with, say, e-bikes? Oh, that's not where I thought you were going. Um, <laughs> sorry. Well, you can uh, answer where you thought I was going to. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I, I mean, I, th I think that's an open question. In fact, um, as a callback to what I was just discussing with Commissioner Trumka, right? The, the, the bicycle standard that we have is, is rather old. Um, generally speaking, the voluntary standard has, in many respects, surpassed uh, our mandatory bicycle standard in terms of some of the safety aspects uh, and performance aspects. We are continuing to work in the voluntary standard um, for bicycles. Um, I would say currently, uh, our, our, neither our mandatory standard nor the voluntary standard are specifically addressing, um, what you're, what you're referring to, but there have been discussions I know about within the voluntary standard context. And I think, um, you know, 1 of the questions at play is how much of this is a bicycle standard question and how much of this is around things like, um, the batteries that are, that are powering, uh, that are used in multiple different products, as we discussed with like micro mobility products, uh, if it's the same battery in different products. Um, and so I think there are, um, it, it's a, it's an open question that definitely deserves our attention uh, and how much of the increased injury uh, rate is simply a usage uh, versus something that we can address in standard, uh, in a standard format is, is also a question. Well, I appreciate that answer, and certainly batteries are a, a distinct issue that we do have to deal with across product categories. But when you say usage, is that because perhaps the bicycles we haven't looked at uh, um, limits on how fast they can go, for example? So presumably, speed and the capacity uh, for bicycles and, and users to accelerate beyond um, uh, rates that they ordinarily would be able to do is something that we can look at within the context of the bicycle regulation. Absolutely. I, I would just note for observational purposes, there also at some point uh, results in a, a cross jurisdictional question with the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. Um, so th there's a lot th to unpack there, but it is certainly something that is uh, something we're looking at and continuing to to think about. Okay, well, thank you. I'm I am glad to hear that. Um, I just have I know my time is about to expire, so I do want to just circle back to sort of the general um, issue about whether we're going to uh, be living at the CR level or even slightly above, but with the inflationary increases essentially being tantamount to a cut. Uh, and so I guess I would like to make uh, a request uh, that you have a commitment here today that you support, particularly uh, all of our work on uh, safe sleep environments for children and for babies. Um, I know uh, there are choices that are to be made here and as a priority for a you know, for the agency for these last several years. And for me personally, that's something that I would be looking forward to as we look at um, what may be difficult choices that I hope that the staff uh, continues to make those priorities. So thank you again. I appreciate all the hard work. Um, and uh, that's all I have, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Boyle. Um, you know, let's finish our second round of questions. I would ask if anybody else has any additional questions at this time. Obviously, staff will remain available to answer more questions as we're getting to closer towards the decisional. Not hearing any, um, I do want to thank staff for this informative briefing and the commissioners for their active participation. 
I think the note that uh, Commissioner Boyle just ended on is a uh, a serious and a real one, given that we don't know what our funding levels are going to be for the coming year, and staying at the CR levels will be hard choices, and um, I think that does not benefit the public um, or safety generally. And also, don't want to lose sight in that that we have and are going through our ARPA funding, and if that runs out without having a corresponding increase in our base appropriations, um, it's going to have a significant impact on exactly the sort of types of things Commissioner Feldman was talking about in terms of the good work that's going on at the ports uh, that we're seeing an increase in um, products being examined. So um, I know I will continue to um, advocate for uh, higher funding levels for the agency. I think the agency both deserves it and can do a tremendous amount of good with uh, the increased levels that we're both talking about the operating plan and uh, anything less than that if Congress, uh, to the extent Congress is, doesn't agree. So with that, uh, again, I thank everybody and I look forward to working with you to finalize the operating plan. And this meeting is adjourned.